Major support for Oregon Field Guide is provided by Dorothy D. Gage and Dan Stanton, Fred and Clara Dolan Charitable Foundation. Tonight on Oregon Field Guide. Down. In one of our most dangerous adventures yet, we enter the depths of the crater on Mount St. Helens in search of a never before explored system of glacier caves. Is everything okay? Everything good. Find out what the caves can tell us about the only growing glacier in the Northwest. And then we head to a secluded alpine meadow on Mount Hood with a photographer who seeks out wilderness areas he says are not only beautiful, but vital to his own health. Good evening and welcome to another edition of Oregon Field Guide. I'm your host, Steve Amon. And we began with a major adventure, a field guide exclusive. For our first story, we're gonna take you into the crater of Mount St. Helens, an active volcano that still steams, hisses and shakes more than 30 years after the 1980 eruption. It is one of the most studied volcanoes on earth and yet, a team of explorers think they may have found a cave within the crater that has never been explored before. So naturally, when we were asked to join an expedition that aimed to make the first descent into that cave, well, we knew field guides Ed Yon and Todd Sonfleet were in for an adventure. We just didn't know how big an adventure it was going to be. Okay, I just came in from being outside. It's about 3 a.m. Um, I discovered uh, some of the team outside by the big tent had, uh, well, they were outside uh, scrambling and all of their stuff was blowing all over the glacier practically. We think the gust had been about uh, probably 40 miles an hour and uh, it's pretty intense <laughs> to say the least. The weather was actually not our biggest worry when we started this trip. We were about to spend five days in the belly of one of America's most active volcanoes, and we had other concerns. Yeah, it's fraught with hazards. Geothermal holes, crevasses, falling rocks, avalanches, poison gas out of certain vents, just to name a few. <laughs> this crater is possibly the most dangerous landscape in America, and for that reason, it's strictly off limits to the public. This trip is the exception. Eddie Cartaya is one of the most accomplished cave explorers in the country, and he and his team were given special permission to investigate something new on Mount St. Helens. It's a cave system that no one has ever entered before. And you're just like, oh my God, this is so incredible. You just feel sucked into it. You don't even want to wait for a rope. You just want to just go in there and we got to get in there, see how deep that thing is. Where does it go? What's in there? What, what's being hidden in there? I mean, but you got to wait and do it right. Hello, hello. How you doing? Good to see you, man. Thanks, Oregon Field Guide was invited to document this expedition because we had experience caving with Eddie. In 2013, we joined Eddie and his partner Brent McGregor on Mount Hood for a groundbreaking expedition to map the largest glacier cave in the lower 48 states. Since then, the two have been seeking out other unexplored caves throughout the Northwest. But pursuing caves in an active volcano is a different kind of crazy. The massive 1980 eruption of Mount St. Helens made all the headlines, but even smaller eruptions, like this one in 2004, left a big mark on the volcano. The very spot where that eruption sent ash thousands of feet in the sky is now a huge magma dome in what was a flat section of crater. It's also our camp. What we're sitting on is the end of the old dome that was formed right after the first eruption. Directly behind you and in front of me is the new dome, which grew just a few years ago. The geothermal center of this volcano is sitting right behind the camera. 
Where we sleep, our beds are warm because the rocks underneath are basically baking a tent from the underside. Yeah. Yeah. You can actually put your clothes under your thermal rest and dry your clothes. That's what I found out. It's crazy. All right, guys, so uh, we'll get started. So welcome to Camp Rembrandt on Mount St. Helens. Most of what you see is steam. Yesterday, we did identify one for sure sulfur vent. We'll have to think about how many we send down. Eddie's assembled a team that has a lifetime of experience dealing with the dangers of caving, mountaineering, climbing, and search and rescue. But in the caves, we also face toxic volcanic gases that can kill in an instant. Can you see that? Hold that up to where you can see the, 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 the meter. Can you see that? Thanks, Dave. When it's working, there's always going to be air flowing in. We're only going to use them if the entrance in the cave run into some bad atmosphere. Maybe the volcano burps and the gas gets worse. Then this will be a rescue only. We're not going to use these to go in and explore. It looks on the surface that, you know, why would we be doing this? To see a glacier, one of the few glaciers in the world that's growing, where all else is melting. There's a real fascination in what's different about this glacier. Why is it here? Why is it growing the way it's growing? On top of one of the most active volcanoes in the world. It's a unique combination of fire and ice. It, should, it looks pretty flat, guys. You know something interesting, fascinating, has to be going on with the interface of two forces like that. Even before they get to the caves, the team has to pass what we call the shooting gallery. Ooh, wow. The 1980 eruption of Mount St. Helens did more than just send ash out into the sky. It also blasted unstable cliffs out of what was the inside of the mountain. And car-sized boulders have peeled off the cliffs ever since. All that rock, combined with avalanching snow in a crater that doesn't see much sun, is why this is one of the only growing glaciers in the country. This time-lapse model, created by the Cascade Volcano Observatory, shows a glacier advancing down the mountain at times up to three feet a day, just since 2004. This at a time when glaciers nearly everywhere else are shrinking. I'm worried about these sleds sliding down into that hole. Me too. After an hour of climbing, Eddie's team reaches the opening they hope will lead them inside that glacier. They call it the Godzilla Hole. This is the largest entrance that we located. We actually saw it from an aerial reconnaissance. We actually don't even know how deep it is. But we're thinking just based on glacier depth, a 300-foot rope should cover it, unless it's a big surprise. There's no guidebook. There's no uh, beta from your buddy who climbed it last year. Uh, so. Uh, going a little bit slower and, and thinking through all the potential things that could surprise us. Okay, so are we ready? Have you been checked or safety? Yeah. All right, here we go. Eddie leads a small team including Jared Smith, Craig McClure, and photographer Eric Guth down a two-stage descent. Down, please. First, down a steep 100-foot funnel. I can see the bottom now. Rope! Then it's a free hanging drop into a pit filled with a threatening swirl of vapors. Look at the size of this thing. Oh, it's overhung, all right. All right, I'm going. Down, down. Yeah, keep going down. Down. For the first drop, we were pretty unnerved because we didn't know what, what that gas was. You know, that could have been hydrogen sulfide, sulfur dioxide, anything like that. We got people set up everywhere ready to yank me out of the hole. Keep going. Down. But the air tests safe. Okay, Barb. Thanks. And Eddie's soon joined by the others in an 80-foot high ice cathedral. These are the first images ever recorded inside this cave. 
That is awesome! When I stepped foot in this cave, I mean, it wasn't a step, it was a dangle. <laughs> kind of spinning in that oblivion for a little while. And that was, that was awesome. So to enter it in the fashion that we did was just breathtaking. Yeah, being here, yeah, it just, it, it fills you with life force. Yeah, it just makes you feel alive and you're happy to be alive. <laughs> Turn your monitor on. It's, just, it's clear in here. We got 20.4 oxygen. And check out this room. The team moves deeper into a steep, dark passage. No one knows where this goes. The discovery of this cave has special meaning for Jared Smith. It was Jared who initially spotted Godzilla Hole while on a climbing trip. I've been looking at these holes for many years from the rim and uh, always wanted to come down and just check them out. You know, I didn't want to do it illegally. I just sat down and then took it in for a minute, took a few photographs, and it was, I was in awe. It was beautiful. One of the objectives of this trip is simply to document this new discovery. This is one of the biggest caves I've ever been in, without question. Eric Guth has photographed glacier caves from Alaska to Patagonia. For me, the draw is, is beauty. It, it just all starts from, from beauty. There's something about knowing you're going to be one of the only people to ever photograph something like this. And if someone returns, it's not going to be the way it was when you were there last time. As we finally start to make our way out, Neil Marchington makes an unusual discovery. It's a young tree growing in darkness. So we're collecting a five-needle conifer sapling. You can see the seed pod that it came with. Uh, go like, straight uphill from Barb. Woo, crazy. Hi, this is Brent. Hey, Brent, it's Eddie up here in the greater Mount St. Helens. How's it going? Oh, good. Eddie, how are you guys doing up there? A long day of surveying. And There's a bittersweet side to this trip. Eddie's longtime caving partner, Brent McGregor, was injured while scouting for this Mount St. Helens trip. Instead of leading the expedition, he agreed to be our link to the outside world. So what is the forecast? Yeah, I guess if you can read it off starting tonight. Tonight, they're calling for rain with a low around 47. New precipitation amounts between a quarter and half an inch are possible. Okay. On Wednesday morning, clouds build below, but in the crater, it's all sunshine. We take advantage of the clear weather to make an early start towards a new cave about a quarter mile from the Godzilla hole. Yeah, watch your step here. It doesn't have a name yet, so we just call it Cave 2 and the team soon finds it's a lot more confined than the Godzilla hole. Is everything okay? Everything good. On the surface, Dr. Woody Peoples has everything he needs in case of emergency. This is my large medical kit. But he's growing increasingly concerned about gas in the caves below. It's unnerving. I know that Eddie is an excellent caver and he's got a lot of experience and they have the monitors problem is they're all in the same place at the same time and if they start to get into a situation where the hydrogen sulfide is high getting out of there could be difficult before they become overcome by the gas right now our o2 levels are at 20.4 and nothing else is registering on the reader so we're safe to travel through definitely steamy in here, so it gets a little warmer the further down we get. Every minute spent in the cave is another minute exposed to an unnatural degree of risk. Down, 3.1. So the team works fast as they survey and record the dimensions of the cave. Between Godzilla Hole and Cave 2, they map over 1,400 feet of previously unexplored passages. But they also notice something unusual. These caves are basically dry, unlike what they found on Mount Hood. We kind of naturally expected similar things. Maybe a one big hole and long linear passages with water and waterfalls. But on Mount St. Helens, it's heat from the volcanic core that seems to be sculpting the caves. 
Wow, really hot right here. Of course, now it makes sense. Steam, it's gonna keep burning its way up until it gets to the surface. So of course, it's gonna make these rooms pretty much at the height as the glacier is deep. So the surprises were here that were shorter than we expected, but they were much bigger and taller and a little more complex than we expected. It's just different. It was a surprise. Oh, you okay? I'm good. That would be the crevasse I just pulled this pole out of. The team was in the cave so long, they hardly noticed the clouds moving up into the crater. The expedition hunkered down for what we thought would be a passing storm. The next day, more of the same. And a planned third trip to the caves is put on hold by a relentless wall of rain. It makes everything just a little bit more difficult. And everything's, people are cold and wet, gear doesn't dry out. If someone gets hurt, we don't have the easy evacuation we had. So just the consequence goes up of any hazard. It's about a 10 on a scale of 10. It's getting scale. pretty brutal right now. For a while, it was just raining. But now, the wind's picked up. If there's any way to get out of here right now, we'd be going. By this point, the expedition is pinned down. There's no trail out of the crater, and the helicopter can't fly when the crater is socked in. The storm only picks up steam as night falls. That's when photographer Todd Sonfleet turned the camera on himself to report that all hell had broken loose. Okay, I just uh, came back from being outside. It's uh, about 3 a.m. at the moment. Uh, that big cabin tent, uh, it had blown apart and all of their stuff blowing all over the glacier practically. The next morning, the team managed to salvage a heavily damaged tent that was home for six people. And then our situation went from bad to worse. The helicopter that brought the OPB crew and much of the expedition gear in was not coming back. There's three layers of clouds. You don't need the whole meteorology report. He can't do it. Is it going to happen today? There's another front off the coast that's coming. It's going to actually make things worse later this afternoon. Uh, obviously, now we all have to walk out. Everyone's already wet and cold. And, you know, it sucks, but as soon as we start moving, you're going to warm up, and we just need to keep moving. That's why I want packs light. Only take, you know, food, water, things you can't live without for the next two days when you get home. Well, here's how this story ends. You can forgive us for not shooting much more video, but we had to leave thousands of pounds of gear on the ice and undergo a hair-raising evacuation, cross-country and without a trail. Somehow, we all survived. And days later, the helicopter returned for our gear. As scary as this all was, once we made our way out, we couldn't help but talk about returning. Mount St. Helens is one of America's great wonders. And Eddie thinks that somewhere beneath this crater, there could still be up to a mile of caves where no one has ever stepped foot. I feel like it was pumping out more than yesterday. We came up here really not knowing what we were going to find. So the fact that we've gone through the two biggest glacier cave systems that we have identified here in two days was phenomenal. Sometimes the most dangerous places are the most beautiful and attractive from an exploratory standpoint. Ed and Todd can tell you from experience that there are extremely good reasons why the crater is closed to the public except for research. This was probably one of the most dangerous stories we've ever done. And while we welcome the opportunity to share this amazing discovery with you, we cannot emphasize enough that public access into the crater is illegal. There are, however, plenty of trails around Mount St. Helens that offer good views from the rim and into the crater. And we provided a link thanks to Outdoor Project on our website. You probably heard that America's Wilderness Act recently turned 50. Congress had set aside millions of acres of public land to protect their most pristine wildness for future generations. 
throughout the season. We'll feature several stories involving wilderness areas. And tonight, Vince Patton shares the story of one man's experience with mountain climbing, emergency surgery, and the healing power of the wilderness. I'm most comfortable as high up on the mountain as I can get. I'm Peter Marbeck. I'm an outdoor photographer uh, based in Hood River, Oregon. I've been here for 21 years. It's that simple joy of putting one foot in front of another and just going up and up and up and up and up. It's so simple yet so rewarding, so beneficial, so renewing. I mean, how could it not be a good thing? The Vista Ridge Trail at Mount Hood quickly crosses an invisible line. Signs and a permit box tell Peter Marbach he's entering wilderness. To me, wilderness, it's not just a place that's unspoiled beauty that's far away from the tramplings of man, but it's also a wilderness where there's landscapes of memories that you create for yourself. Peter encounters several visible boundaries on this hike as well. First, the Dollar Lake Fire Zone. What I love about this trek is that you start off in this burn zone, which is phenomenal. It's a very ethereal, almost like a, a moonscape left over from the fire a few years ago. Walking through that is very eerie, yet beautiful. Since this is a designated wilderness area, no one will come in and replant. The woods must recover from the fire as nature intended. Fireweed looks great up there. It looks like the seed pod from bear grass. It's beautiful. And these, I'm not sure what these are. Wow, look at the, the detail on that the shape. Looks like little arrowheads. Peter really has just barely begun his hike. He's got one particular spot in mind many miles up the mountain. Because that's where the beauty is, and it's where few people go. It requires walking. The simplest, easiest, most beneficial thing to all of us. The, the more wild, the more raw, the harder the journey to get here, I like that better. There's like this thin lines, like a veil that you're passing through on your way up to this abode of spirits high up on the mountain. And then you get up to where you hit the Timberline Trail and suddenly it's like, ta-da, you're in the open area. So you leave the forested area behind and you enter into that, that, that zone of, uh, you know you're in someplace special with the, with the boulders and the flowers and you just keep ascending and it becomes a little more rugged, a little more wild. Peter likes it even wilder, up higher and off the main trail. It's a wilderness that's earned for sure. I'm kind of a glutton for punishment, no pain, no gain. These kinds of things, the reward is so much more richer because you've had to earn it, you've had to suffer for it. I always feel most alive when I'm coming up through this zone because you know you're in a place that's a little bit different. Pure glacial melt. Nothing like it. Oh yeah. I can carry very little water coming up here because that stream will always provide for you. Nectar of the gods. He's not satisfied until he makes it high above the tree line. For him, this is not merely recreation. Peter believes his health depends on it especially after one hike in 2001 coming off Mount Hood. At that moment, I felt my heart do something that was very unusual. There was no pain. It just felt like it rolled over on its side. This young, vibrant, billy goat of a man who'd been climbing mountains all over the world suddenly found himself at the hospital having his heart checked. Within about 30 minutes of the end of the angiogram, they came in and they said, uh, we've had a cancellation. We want to put you in the open heart surgery right away. I ended up having triple bypass. So I was very fortunate. I did not have a heart attack, just had clogged arteries. Recovery was a challenge. Um, physically, it was uh, pretty easy. Psychologically, that was a real struggle for me. It was devastating, I'll, I'll, I'll be honest. Um, here I was in my early 40s, you know, I thought I was uh, in, invincible. You know, out hiking, backpacking, anything I could set my mind to do, I would do. And then suddenly to be floored by something like this, um, was really hard for me uh, to, to handle. He set a goal to return to the peak of Mount Hood. I had climbed it many years prior to that, and uh, this place is, is my church. Less than nine months later, I was standing on the summit of Mount Hood. Yet, it wasn't enough. 
he still couldn't shake the insult his heart had dealt him. For me, I needed to get back to my office. I needed to get back to the place where I felt I was whole again. You know, I wanted to get back to my life as a photographer. Peter found his greatest healing by returning time and again to wilderness. The only place I could feel like I was going to be able to accelerate my healing was to be able to get back up above treeline and into places like this. So this is it, this is the spot. He discovered an alpine meadow with blooms that change by the week. There are a lot of beautiful meadows on Mount Hood, but this one just really calls out to me. One year the bloom is fantastic, another year it's okay, but uh, it's always satisfying to come here. Coming back to places like this every year, it keeps me going, it keeps me young at heart. And this year, he returned yet again to the summit on the very anniversary of his heart surgery. Got up there within about five, 10 minutes before the sunrise and I brought some prayer flags that I brought back from an expedition I went to Nepal last spring. And I got the most amazing images that morning. I mean, just phenomenal. Some of the best I've ever gotten from the summit of Mount Hood. You look over your shoulder and there's this amazing, surreal pyramid shadow that forms. It's so beautiful, but it's so fleeting. It's over in a minute. I needed that. I needed that morning. Oh yeah, look at that. Nice reflection. It's my little pond, my little reflection pond. A place to reflect and do photography. You see things that very few people get to experience and that's why I work so hard to get in those places and wait until the light is good and try to come home with some images that are worth sharing with the rest of the community who don't have the opportunity or the desire or the physical abilities to get up there. Oh man, this does not get any better than this. Peter says he feels fine now. He's especially grateful to those who saw the value of protecting wilderness as it is, back when he was eight years old. I'm glad that these men and women had the foresight to pass this legislation. And I feel like the more time I spend here, the more time I come back here, when I leave, when I get back down to the lowlands, I'm a better person. I know it's always gonna be here. As long as I'm healthy and can walk and heart stays strong, I'll, I'll keep coming back here again and again and again for the rest of my life. Peter was among a group of artists chosen by the Forest Service to celebrate the 50th anniversary of the Wilderness Act. You can see some of his images on our website at opb.org slash field guide. And that's it for another edition of Oregon Field Guide. If you'd like to watch any of our stories again, or you have any questions or comments, please visit our website at opb.org slash field guide. And for more behind the scenes look, you can check us out on Facebook. And until next week, thanks for joining us. Major support for Oregon Field Guide is provided by Dorothy D. Gage and Dan Stanton, Fred and Clara Dolan Charitable Foundation, additional support provided by Kay Kitagawa and Andy Johnson Laird, Christine and David Vernier, Coit Family Foundation, and the following, and viewers like you. Thank you.